Section twenty seven of Round the Sofa by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Poor Clare, Part Four. What was to be done next was the question that I asked myself. As for Lucy, she would fain have submitted to the doom that lay upon her. Her gentleness and piety, under the pressure of so horrible a life, seemed over-passive to me. She never complained. Mrs. Clark complained more than ever. As for me, I was more in love with the real Lucy than ever, but I shrunk from the false similitude with an intensity proportioned to my love. I found out by instinct that Mrs. Clark had occasional temptations to leave Lucy. The good lady's nerves were shaken and from what she said i could almost have concluded that the object of the double was to drive away from lucy this last and almost earliest friend at times i could scarcely bear to own it but i myself felt inclined to turn recreant and i would accuse lucy of being too patient too resigned one after another she won the little children of cold home Mrs. Clark and she had resolved to stay there, for was it not as good a place as any other to such as they? And did not all our faint hopes rest on Bridget, never seen or heard of now, but still we trusted to come back or give some token? So as I say, one after another, the little children came about my Lucy, won by her soft tones and her gentle smiles and kind actions. Alas! One after another they fell away, and shrunk from her path with blanching terror, and we too surely guessed the reason why. It was the last drop. I could bear it no longer. I resolved no more to linger around the spot, but to go back to my uncle, and among the learned divines of the City of London, seek for some power whereby to annul the curse. My uncle, meanwhile, had obtained all the requisite testimonials relating to Lucy's descent and birth, from the Irish lawyers and from Mr. Gisborne. The latter gentleman had written from abroad. He was again serving in the Austrian army. A letter alternately passionately self-reproachful and stoically repellent. It was evident that when he thought of Mary, her short life, how he had wronged her, and of her violent death, he could hardly find words severe enough for his own conduct, and from this point of view the curse that Bridget had laid upon him and his was regarded by him as a prophetic doom, to the utterance of which she was moved by a higher power, working for the fulfilment of a deeper vengeance than for the death of the poor dog. But then again, when he came to speak of his daughter, the repugnance which the conduct of the demoniac creature had produced in his mind was but ill disguised under a show of profound indifference as to Lucy's fate. One almost felt as if he would have been as content to put her out of existence as he would have been to destroy some disgusting reptile that had invaded his chamber or his couch. The great Fitzgerald property was Lucy's and that was all, was nothing. My uncle and I sat in the gloom of a London November evening in our house in Ormond Street. I was out of health and felt as if I were in an inextricable coil of misery. Lucy and I wrote to each other, but that was little, and we dared not see each other for dread of the fearful third, who had more than once taken her place at our meetings. My uncle had, on the day I speak of, bidden prayers to be put up on the ensuing Sabbath in many a church and meeting-house in London, for one grievously tormented by an evil spirit. He had faith in prayers, I had none. I was fast losing faith in all things. So we sat, he trying to interest me in the old talk of other days, I oppressed by one thought when our old servant Antony opened the door, and without speaking showed in a very gentlemanly and prepossessing man, who had something remarkable about his dress, betraying his profession to be that of the Roman Catholic priesthood. He glanced at my uncle first, 
then at me. It was to me he bowed. I did not give my name, said he, because you would hardly have recognized it, unless, sir, when in the north you heard of Father Bernard, the chaplain of Stony Hurst. I remembered afterwards that I had heard of him, but at the time I had utterly forgotten it, so I professed myself a complete stranger to him, while my ever-hospitable uncle, although hating a papist as much as it was in his nature to hate anything, placed a chair for the visitor, and bade Antony bring glasses and a fresh jug of claret. Father Bernard received this courtesy with the graceful ease and pleasant acknowledgement which belongs to the man of the world. Then he turned to scan me with his keen glance. After some slight conversation, entered into on his part, I am certain with an intention of discovering on what terms of confidence I stood with my uncle, he paused and said gravely, I am sent here with a message to you, sir, from a woman to whom you have shown kindness, and who is one of my penitents in Antwerp, one Bridget Fitzgerald. Bridget Fitzgerald, exclaimed I, in Antwerp? Tell me, sir, all that you can about her. There is much to be said, he replied, but may I inquire if this gentleman, if your uncle, is acquainted with the particulars of which you and I stand informed? All that I know, he knows, said I eagerly, laying my hand on my uncle's arm, as he made a motion as if to quit the room. Then I have to speak before two gentlemen who, however they may differ from me in faith, are yet fully impressed with the fact that there are evil powers going about continually to take cognizance of our evil thoughts, and, if their master gives them power, to bring them into overt action. Such is my theory of the nature of that sin of which I dare not disbelieve, as some sceptics would have us do, the sin of witchcraft. Of this deadly sin you and I are aware Bridget Fitzgerald has been guilty. Since you saw her last, many prayers have been offered in our churches, many masses sung, many penances undergone, in order that, if God and the holy saints so willed it, her sin might be blotted out. But it has not been so willed. Explain to me, said I, who you are, and how you come connected with Bridget. Why is she at Antwerp? I pray you, sir, tell me more. If I am impatient, excuse me. I am ill and feverish, and in consequence bewildered. There was something to me inexpressibly soothing in the tone of voice with which he began to narrate, as it were, from the beginning, his acquaintance with Bridget. I had known Mr. and Mrs. Starkey during their residence abroad, and so it fell out naturally that, when I came as chaplain to the Sherborns at Stonyhurst, our acquaintance was renewed, and thus I became the confessor of the whole family, isolated as they were from the officers of the church, Sherborne being their nearest neighbour who professed the true faith. Of course you are aware that facts revealed in confession are sealed as in the grave, but I learnt enough of Bridget's character to be convinced that I had to do with no common woman, one powerful for good as for evil. I believe that I was able to give her spiritual assistance from time to time, and that she looked upon me as a servant of that holy church which has such wonderful power of moving men's hearts and relieving them of the burden of their sins. I have known her cross the moors on the wildest night of storms to confess and be absolved, and then she would return calmed and subdued to her daily work about her mistress no one witting where she had been during the hours that most passed in sleep upon their beds. After her daughter's departure, after Mary's mysterious disappearance, I had to impose many a long penance in order to wash away the sin of impatient repining that was fast leading her into the deeper guilt of blasphemy. She set out on that long journey of which you have possibly heard, that fruitless journey in search of Mary, and during her absence my superiors ordered my return to my former duties at Antwerp, 
and for many years I heard no more of Bridget. Not many months ago, as I was passing homeward in the evening along one of the streets near Saint-Jacques, leading into the Mir Strait, I saw a woman sitting crouched up under the shrine of the Holy Mother of Sorrows. Her hood was drawn over her head, so that the shadow caused by the light of the lamp above fell deep over her face. Her hands were clasped round her knees. It was evident that she was someone in hopeless trouble, and as such it was my duty to stop and speak. I naturally addressed her first in Flemish, believing her to be one of the lower class of inhabitants. She shook her head, but did not look up. Then I tried French, and she replied in that language, but speaking it so indifferently that I was sure she was either English or Irish, and consequently spoke to her in my own native tongue. She recognized my voice, and starting up, caught at my robes, dragging me before the blessed shrine, and throwing herself down, and forcing me, as much by her evident desire as by her action, to kneel beside her, she exclaimed, O holy virgin, you will never hearken to me again, but hear him, for you know him of old, that he does your bidding, and strives to heal broken hearts, hear him. She turned to me. She will hear you, if you will only pray. She never hears me. She and all the saints in heaven cannot hear my prayers, for the evil one carries them off, as he carried that first away. Oh, Father Bernard, pray for me. I prayed for one in sore distress, of what nature I could not say, but the Holy Virgin would know. Bridget held me fast, grasping with eagerness at the sound of my words. When I had ended, I rose, and making the sign of the cross over her, I was going to bless her in the name of the Holy Church, when she shrank away like some terrified creature, and said, I am guilty of deadly sin, and am not shriven. Arise, my daughter, said I, and come with me, and I led the way into one of the confessionals of Saint-Jacques. She knelt. I listened. No words came. The evil powers had stricken her dumb, as I heard afterwards they had many a time before when she approached confession. She was too poor to pay for the necessary forms of exorcism, and hitherto those priests to whom she had addressed herself were either so ignorant of the meaning of her broken French or her Irish English or else esteemed her to be one crazed, as, indeed, her wild and excited manner might easily have led any one to think, that they had neglected the sole means of loosening her tongue, so that she might confess her deadly sin, and after due penance obtain absolution. But I knew Bridget of old, and felt that she was a penitent sent to me. I went through those holy offices appointed by our church for the relief of such a case, I was the more bound to do this, as I found that she had come to Antwerp for the sole purpose of discovering me and making confession to me. Of the nature of that fearful confession I am forbidden to speak. Much of it you know, possibly all. It now remains for her to free herself from mortal guilt, and to set others free from the consequences thereof. No prayers, no masses will ever do it although they may strengthen her with that strength by which alone acts of deepest love and purest self-devotion may be performed. Her words of passion and cries for revenge, her unholy prayers could never reach the ears of the holy saints. Other powers intercepted them, and wrought so that the curses thrown up to heaven have fallen on her own flesh and blood, and so, through her very strength of love, have bruised and crushed her heart. Henceforward her former self must be buried, yea, buried quick, if need be, but never more to make sign or utter cry on earth. She has become a poor Clare, in order that, by perpetual penance and constant service of others, she may at length so act as to obtain final absolution and rest for her soul. Until then... The innocent must suffer. It is to plead for the innocent that I come to you, not in the name of the witch, 
Bridget Fitzgerald, but of the penitent and servant of all men, the poor Clare, Sister Magdalene. Sir, said I, I listen to your request with respect, only I may tell you it is not needed to urge me to do all that I can on behalf of one love for whom is part of my very life. If, for a time, I have absented myself from her, it is to think and work for her redemption. I, a member of the English Church, my uncle, a Puritan, pray morning and night for her by name. The congregations of London on the next Sabbath will pray for one unknown, that she may be set free from the powers of darkness. Moreover, I must tell you, sir, that those evil ones touch not the great calm of her soul. She lives her own pure and loving life, unharmed and untainted, though all men fall off from her. I would I could have her faith. My uncle now spoke. Nephew, said he, it seems to me that this gentleman, although professing what I consider an erroneous creed, has touched upon the right point in exhorting Bridget to acts of love and mercy whereby to wipe out her sin of hate and vengeance. Let us strive after our fashion, by almsgiving and visiting of the needy and fatherless, to make our prayers acceptable. Meanwhile, I, myself, will go down into the north, and take charge of the maiden. I am too old to be daunted by man or demon. I will bring her to this house as to a home, and let the double come if it will. A company of godly divines shall give it the meeting, and we will try issue. The kindly, brave old man, but Father Bernard sat on musing. All hate, said he, cannot be quenched in her heart. All Christian forgiveness cannot have entered into her soul, or the demon would have lost its power. You said, I think, that her grandchild was still tormented. Still tormented, I replied sadly, thinking of Mistress Clark's last letter. He rose to go. We afterwards heard that the occasion of his coming to London was a secret political mission on behalf of the Jacobites. Nevertheless, he was a good and wise man. Months and months passed away without any change. Lucy entreated my uncle to leave her where she was dreading, as I learnt, lest if she came with her fearful companion to dwell in the same house with me, that my love could not stand the repeated shocks to which I should be doomed. And this she thought from no distrust of the strength of my affection, but from a kind of pitying sympathy for the terror to the nerves, which she observed that the demoniac visitation caused in all. I was restless and miserable. I devoted myself to good works, but I performed them from no spirit of love, but solely from the hope of reward and payment, and so the reward was never granted. At length I asked my uncle's leave to travel, and I went forth, a wanderer, with no distincter end than that of many another wanderer, to get away from myself. A strange impulse led me to Antwerp, in spite of the wars and commotions then raging in the Low Countries, or rather, perhaps, the very craving to become interested in something external led me to the thick of the struggle then going on with the Austrians. The cities of Flanders were all full at that time of civil disturbances and rebellions, only kept down by force and the presence of an Austrian garrison in every place. I arrived in Antwerp and made inquiry for Father Bernard. He was away in the country for a day or two. Then I asked my way to the convent of poor Clares. But being healthy and prosperous, I could only see the dim, pent-up grey walls shut closely in by narrow streets in the lowest part of the town. My landlord told me that had I been stricken by some loathsome disease, or in desperate case of any kind, the poor Clares would have taken me and tended me. He spoke of them as an order of mercy of the strictest kind, dressing scantily in the coarsest materials, going barefoot 
living on what the inhabitants of Antwerp chose to bestow, and sharing even those fragments and crumbs with the poor and helpless that swarmed all around. Receiving no letters or communication with the outer world, utterly dead to everything but the alleviation of suffering. He smiled at my inquiring whether I could get speech of one of them, and told me that they were even forbidden to speak for the purposes of begging their daily food, while yet they lived and fed others upon what was given in charity. But, exclaimed I, supposing all men forgot them, would they quietly lie down and die without making sign of their extremity? If such were their rule, the poor Clares would willingly do it, but their founder appointed a remedy for such extreme cases as you suggest. They have a bell. Tis but a small one, as I have heard, that has yet never been rung in the memory of man. When the poor Clares have been without food for twenty-four hours, they may ring this bell, and then trust to our good people of Antwerp for rushing to the rescue of the poor Clares, who have taken such blessed care of us in all our straits. It seemed to me that such rescue would be late in the day, but I did not say what I thought. I rather turned the conversation by asking my landlord if he knew or had ever heard anything of a certain Sister Magdalene. Yes, said he, rather under his breath. News will creep out, even from a convent of poor Clares. Sister Magdalene is either a great sinner or a great saint. She does more, as I have heard, than all the other nuns put together. Yet, when last month they would fain have made her mother superior, she begged rather that they would place her below all the rest and make her the meanest servant of all. You never saw her? asked I. Never, he replied. I was weary of waiting for Father Bernard, and yet I lingered in Antwerp. The political state of things became worse than ever, increased to its height by the scarcity of food consequent on many deficient harvests. I saw groups of fierce, squalid men at every corner of the street, glaring out with wolfish eyes at my sleek skin and handsome clothes. At last Father Bernard returned. We had a long conversation, in which he told me that, curiously enough, Mr. Gisborne, Lucy's father, was serving in one of the Austrian regiments then in garrison at Antwerp. I asked Father Bernard if he would make us acquainted, which he consented to do. But a day or two afterwards he told me that, on hearing my name, Mr. Gisborne had declined responding to any advances on my part, saying he had abjured his country and hated his countrymen. Probably he recollected my name in connection with that of his daughter, Lucy. Anyhow, it was clear enough that I had no chance of making his acquaintance. Father Bernard confirmed me in my suspicions of the hidden fermentation for some coming evil working among the blouses of Antwerp, and he would fain have had me depart from out the city. But I rather craved the excitement of danger, and stubbornly refused to leave. One day, when I was walking with him in the Place Verte, he bowed to an Austrian officer who was crossing towards the cathedral. That is Mr. Gisborne, said he, as soon as the gentleman was passed. I turned to look at the tall, slight figure of the officer. He carried himself in a stately manner, although he was past middle age and from his years might have had some excuse for a slight stoop. As I looked at the man, he turned round. His eyes met mine, and I saw his face. Deeply lined, sallow, and scathed was that countenance, scarred by passion as well as by the fortunes of war. T'was but a moment our eyes met. We each turned round and went on our separate way but his whole appearance was not one to be easily forgotten. The thorough appointment of the dress, and evident thought bestowed on it, made but an incongruous whole with the dark, gloomy expression of his countenance. Because he was Lucy's father, I sought instinctively to meet him everywhere. 
At last he must have become aware of my pertinacity, for he gave me a haughty scowl whenever I passed him. In one of these encounters, however, I chanced to be of some service to him. He was turning the corner of a street, and came suddenly on one of the groups of discontented Flemings of whom I have spoken. Some words were exchanged, when my gentleman out with his sword, and with a slight but skilful cut, drew blood from one of those who had insulted him, as he fancied, though I was too far off to hear the words. They would all have fallen upon him had I not rushed forward and raised the cry, then well known in Antwerp, of rally to the Austrian soldiers who were perpetually patrolling the streets, and who came in numbers to the rescue. I think that neither Mr. Gisborne nor the mutinous group of plebeians owed me much gratitude for my interference. He had planted himself against a wall, in a skilful attitude of fence, ready with his bright glancing rapier to do battle with all the heavy, fierce, unarmed men, some six or seven in number. But when his own soldiers came up, he sheathed his sword, and, giving some careless word of command, sent them away again, and continued his saunter all alone down the street, the workmen snarling in his rear, and more than half inclined to fall on me for my cry of rescue. I cared not if they did, my life seemed so dreary a burden just then, and perhaps it was this daring loitering among them that prevented their attacking me. Instead, they suffered me to fall into conversation with them, and I heard some of their grievances. Sore and heavy to be borne were they, and no wonder the sufferers were savage and desperate. The man whom Gisborne had wounded across his face would fain have got out of me the name of his aggressor, but I refused to tell it. Another of the group heard his inquiry and made answer. I know the man. He is one Gisborne, aide-de-camp to the general commandant. I know him well. He began to tell some story in connection with Gisborne in a low and muttering voice, and while he was relating a tale which I saw excited their evil blood, and which they evidently wished me not to hear, I sauntered away and back to my lodgings. That night Antwerp was in open revolt. The inhabitants rose in rebellion against their Austrian masters. The Austrians, holding the gates of the city, remained at first pretty quiet in the citadel. Only, from time to time, the boom of a great cannon swept sullenly over the town. But if they expected the disturbance to die away and spend itself in a few hours' fury, they were mistaken. In a day or two the rioters held possession of the principal municipal buildings. Then the Austrians poured forth in bright flaming array, calm and smiling as they marched to the posts assigned, as if the fierce mob were no more to them than the swarms of buzzing summer flies. Their practised manoeuvres, their well-aimed shot, told with terrible effect, but in the place of one slain rioter, three sprang up of his blood to avenge his loss. But a deadly foe, a ghastly ally of the Austrians, was at work. Food, scarce and dear for months, was now hardly to be obtained at any price. Desperate efforts were being made to bring provisions into the city, for the rioters had friends without. Close to the city port, nearest to the Scheldt, a great struggle took place. I was there, helping the rioters whose cause I had adopted. We had a savage encounter with the Austrians. Numbers fell on both sides. I saw them lie bleeding for a moment, then a volley of smoke obscured them, and when it cleared away, they were dead, trampled upon or smothered, pressed down and hidden by the freshly wounded whom those last guns had brought low. And then a grey-robed and grey-veiled figure came right across the flashing guns and stooped over someone whose life-blood was ebbing away. Sometimes it was to give him drink from some cans which they carried slung at their sides. Sometimes I saw the cross held above a dying man and rapid prayers were being uttered, unheard by men in that hellish din and clangour, but listened to by one above. I saw all this as in a dream. The reality of that stern time was battle and carnage, but I knew that these grey figures, 
their bare feet all wet with blood and their faces hidden by their veils were the poor clares sent forth now because dire agony was abroad and imminent danger at hand therefore they left their cloistered shelter and came into that thick and evil melee close to me driven past me by the struggle of many fighters came the antwerp burgess with the scarce healed scar upon his face and in an instant more he was thrown by the press upon the austrian officer gisborne and ere either had recovered the shock the burgess had recognized his opponent ha the englishman gisborne he cried and threw himself upon him with redoubled fury he had struck him hard the englishman was down when out of the smoke came a dark grey figure and threw herself right under the uplifted flashing sword the burgess's arm stood arrested neither austrians nor anversois willingly harmed the poor clares leave him to me said a low stern voice he is mine enemy mine for many years those words were the last i heard i myself was struck down by a bullet i remember nothing more for days when i came to myself i was at the extremity of weakness and was craving for food to recruit my strength my landlord sat watching me he too looked pinched and shrunken he had heard of my wounded state and sought me out yes the struggle still continued but the famine was sore and some he had heard had died for lack of food the tears stood in his eyes as he spoke but soon he shook off his weakness and his natural cheerfulness returned father bernard would come back that afternoon he had promised but father bernard never came although i was up and dressed and looking eagerly for him my landlord brought me a meal which he had cooked himself of what it was composed he would not say but it was most excellent and with every mouthful i seemed to gain strength the good man sat looking at my evident enjoyment with a happy smile of sympathy but as my appetite became satisfied i began to detect a certain wistfulness in his eyes as if craving for the food i had so nearly devoured for indeed at that time i was hardly aware of the extent of the famine suddenly there was a sound of many rushing feet past our window my landlord opened one of the sides of it the better to learn what was going on then we heard a faint cracked tinkling bell coming shrill upon the air clear and distinct from all other sounds holy mother exclaimed the landlord the poor clares he snatched up the fragments of my meal and crammed them into my hands bidding me follow downstairs he ran clutching at more food as the woman of his house eagerly held it out to him and in a moment we were in the street moving along with the great current all tending towards the convent of the poor clares and still as if piercing our ears with its inarticulate cry came the shrill tinkle of the bell in that strange crowd were old men trembling and sobbing as they carried their little pittance of food women with the tears running down their cheeks who had snatched up what provisions they had in the vessels in which they stood so that the burden of these was in many cases much greater than that which they contained children with flushed faces grasping tight the morsel of bitten cake or bread in their eagerness to carry it safe to the help of the poor clares strong men yea both anversois and austrians pressing onward with set teeth and no word spoken and over all and through all came that sharp tinkle that cry for help in extremity we met the first torrent of people returning with blanched and piteous faces they were issuing out of the convent to make way for the offerings of others haste haste said they a poor clare is dying a poor clare is dead for hunger god forgive us and our city we pressed on the stream bore us along where it would we were carried through refectories bare and crumbless into the cells over whose doors the conventual names of the occupant was written thus it was that i 
with others, was forced into Sister Magdalene's cell. On her couch lay Gisborne, pale unto death, but not dead. By his side was a cup of water and a small morsel of mouldy bread, which he had pushed out of his reach and could not move to obtain. Over against his bed were these words copied in the English version. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Some of us gave him of our food and left him eating greedily like some famished wild animal. For now it was no longer the sharp tinkle, but that one solemn toll which in all Christian countries tells of the passing of the spirit out of earthly life into eternity. And again a murmur gathered and grew as of many people speaking with awed breath. A poor Clare is dying, a poor Clare is dead. Borne along once more by the motion of the crowd, we were carried into the chapel belonging to the poor Clares. On a bier before the high altar lay a woman, lay Sister Magdalene, lay Bridget Fitzgerald. By her side stood Father Bernard, in his robes of office, and holding the crucifix on high, while he pronounced the solemn absolution of the church, as to one who had newly confessed herself of deadly sin. I pushed on with passionate force till I stood close to the dying woman as she received extreme unction amid the breathless and awed hush of the multitude around. Her eyes were glazing, her limbs were stiffening, but when the rite was over and finished she raised her gaunt figure slowly up and her eyes brightened to a strange intensity of joy as, with the gesture of her finger and the trance-like gleam of her eye, she seemed like one who watched the disappearance of some loathed and fearful creature. She is freed from the curse, said she, as she fell back dead. Now, of all our party who at first listened to my Lady Ludlow, Mr. Preston was the only one who had not told us something, either of information, tradition, history or legend. We naturally turned to him, but we did not like asking him directly for his contribution, for he was a grave, reserved and silent man. He understood us, however, and, rousing himself, as it were, he said, I know you wish me to tell you, in my turn, of something which I have learnt or heard during my life. I could tell you something of my own life, and of a life dearer still to my memory, but I have shrunk from narrating anything so purely personal. Yet, shrink as I will, no other but those sad recollections will present themselves to my mind. I call them sad when I think of the end of it all. However, I am not going to moralize. If my dear brother's life and death does not speak for itself, no words of mine will teach you what may be learnt from it. End of the Poor Clare Section 27